Hello, everybody. Kirk Spano, Investing 2020s, and we're going to talk inflation and stock market and all sorts of neat stuff today. So this chart I want to explain to you. This is the number of components showing less than a 3% year-over-year inflation in their particular component. As you can see, more and more parts of the CPI have lower and lower inflation. That's what that shows. These are things that have less than 3% inflation. So it just keeps on rising, which is good. We want fewer things with inflation over 3%. Import prices came down for a very long period of time. Small uptick. And that caused a lot of angst in the last week or so in the market. I wouldn't expect this to be up too much. This is almost all oil. This is the Mannheim car report that shows that inflation for automobiles is coming down dramatically. And I think people uh, remember me talking about this about a year ago. And so far that has followed through. Typically, inflation follows car prices on a leg. It says two months here, but my experience has been about six months. Either way, lots of downward pricing pressure on automobiles. Home buyer housing payments, though, are expensive. They still are staying up there. Why? Mortgages are expensive and rents have gone up as well. We have just started to see rents start to come down in certain markets where there was building. And I would expect that that will continue. You know, my experience there is that there's a lot of projects that are on hold, but there's also a lot of projects that were started a couple of years ago that are just finishing up and getting tenants in the next couple of months. So we should see an uptick in rental units available. We still have a problem with housing units and high interest rates or actually normal interest rates are keeping people from moving around. And as arms come due, uh, they have to figure out a way to afford things. So there's a lot of pressure on the Federal Reserve to lower interest rates just to help people with their housing costs. Wage growth tracker. So huge increase in wages during 2001, 2, 3. And now this doesn't say wages are coming down. It just means that the rate of growth of wages has come down. So wages are only increasing 4 or 5% per year right now after a huge surge for a couple of years. And that's probably about right. You want wages to increase a little bit more than inflation. So if it settles right in this range, you know, right in this range too, we're in good shape. This is what happened after the financial crisis because there were so many people unemployed. We do not want to see a lot of people unemployed because then wages actually go down at the household level. And that's why I talk about the Federal Reserve can't mess around with employment. If they break employment, they break everything. So basically, wage growth is back to its pre-2019 average and pre-financial crisis average, according to Indeed. And the numbers I showed you before, different set of stats, but it's a pretty clear trend that wage increases spiked in 21 and 22 and have gradually settled back. So everybody got their raise. Now, unless there's high un unemployment, the odds of losing those wage gains are very low. But as we saw on this slide, if we do get a surge in unemployment, then wages collapse. So what we have to make sure is that the Fed does not allow that to happen. Mohamed El Arian has been on Bloomberg for the last two weeks saying, hey, the Fed can say data dependent all they want, but they need to look forward. They cannot allow a recession. Here's the producer price indexes. So you can see that inflation for producers has come way down too. So at the factory and producer level, there's not a lot of inflation anymore. So there's not really a lot of reason for price increases on goods, but at the moment, uh, you still have some gouging going on and that should probably be gone at some point because producer prices are not going up. Now, what does this what does this say right here? That says that the commodity super cycle that everybody wants to pound the table on ain't really there. So this is from Tom Lee over at Fundstrat. Uh, he points out that almost the entire inflation reading on CPI was due to auto insurance. And I've talked about that a number of times. For whatever reason, the cost of insurance on autos is going way up. I don't really understand that. I understand why home insurance and other commercial insurance has gone up because of the climate change risk, especially in states you know, like Florida. But you take a look at auto insurance, you ask why, why has it gone up? We talked about this a week or two ago. I think that the insurance companies really saw their last chance to raise rates 
and they understand the AI, and this is something that we talked about probably a year ago, AI and drones have really lowered the cost of insurance, of administering insurance. So I think you're going to see auto insurance rates stabilize. And I think you're even going to see homeowners and commercial insurance stabilize for a while. I think those actually go up again in the future. But you're going to see the pressure for rising inflation rates on inflation, or rising insurance rates on inflation uh, dissipate over the next several months. So everybody also talks about the horrible federal deficit. And as you can see, Back in the Obama years, post-financial crisis, they brought the deficit down a lot, and then it started going up again under Trump. And, and, and I give a waiver for the COVID stuff, and it started to come down again, although not as much as you'd like. So we still have a trillion and a half annual projected deficit, and this is what it looks like over a long period of time. So under President Reagan, it started to really ramp up. This was tax cuts without any cuts in spending. And actually, they increased spending. Then under Clinton, it kind of leveled off. Then under Bush, it jumped up. Then we had the financial crisis, and it jumped up again. Then Donald Trump got in and did another massive rant, round of tax cuts, and it jumped up again. And then he had COVID, and it jumped up again. And nobody seems to do what President Clinton did, which is flatten it out. So we're at a point where we need to flatten it out. But how do you do it? Well, if we extend the... Trump tax cuts that probably adds three to four hundred billion a year to the deficit. So we really can't do that. But what we do know is that almost all of the tax cuts went to the wealthiest one percent. So this is really what they have to attack, and to a lesser extent, this. So the tax cuts for the top five percent, but really the top one percent, is where most of the money goes from the Trump tax cuts. So there's a lot of pressure on the Federal Reserve then to do what they need to do to help with paying for the federal deficit, which even with the tax cuts expiring, uh, still leaves us with somewhat of a annual deficit, which we need to get back down to that half trillion a year range that it was under President Obama. So if the Fed funds rate way up here is at 5.37 on average, and we have an inverted yield curve, what does that say about what the Fed has to do? It means that the Fed has to bring this down to lower the interest on the debt, because right now we're paying a trillion dollars of interest uh, every four to six months, and that really is unsustainable. So super low interest rates at some point is going to be the name of the game. I don't think we get down to zero again, but I do think we get to that 2 to 3% range. And that's not going to happen in the next year, but the next time there's a sniff of recession, that's what they'll do. I do think we get down to around four and a half this year. And that really will amount to the first rate cut happening in June, which is my projection, being a half a point to, as I've discussed, taking the last rate increase off the table with the explanation that, hey, maybe this isn't the start of a rate cut cycle. It will be, but they'll soft pedal it. I think ultimately we get 1% of reductions this year, a half a point, maybe followed by a couple quarter points later in the year. Maybe they hold their breath into the election and they wait till after the election to do another half point, something like that. Hard, hard to know exactly. But these are what all the banks are saying as of a couple of days ago. I guess I'm on board with Morgan Stanley. 100 basis point of cuts starting in June. And I think they're going to start with the half point. So what have we seen in the markets? We have seen the investment grade bond flows surge for 12 weeks. So that's basically telling you that the expectation from big bond investors is that interest rates are going to come down. Otherwise, they wouldn't be piling into investment-grade bonds. And if you take a look at the S&P 500, you also see that your price-to-earnings ratio is pretty high. Price-to-book value is pretty high. Return on equity, though, is doing pretty good. But the dividend yield is really low. So a 10 to 20% correction, and I don't think we're going to get to 20% this year, but a 10% correction brings us back down to about 18, 19, 18, back in this area, brings this down to about this area, pushes dividends up to about this area, and then brings return, actually improves return on equity. So what we have to ask ourselves is, can we keep getting a return on equity that somehow reflects earnings not coming down? And I think that the answer is yes. And I think it's a lot slower than people are going to imagine but ultimately, AI allows greater productivity. And we've seen charts on productivity that I've showed 
that we've been in a trough on productivity for a decade, and it looks like it's about to ramp up. But everybody thinks about, oh, it's going to happen right away. And the reality is, is that it'll take time. So I think we end up with a choppy market over the next decade or so, but we still haven't reached the peak. So weekly equity inflows actually fell off a cliff. So we've had outflows, and mainly the outflows are from large caps, which is what I warned you about. I think this keeps up for next several weeks, maybe into May, especially as the 401k matching dissipates after April 15th, a couple days away. And so we should think about what happens when the Fed lowers rates because there's pressure on them to do it, not just from the banks, but from the federal government because they have to lower the price of the debt. And because they know that if they somehow hurt employment, if they somehow cause a recession, that that blows up the budget too. And people want to start crying about inflation. I just showed you a second ago, inflation's only coming from a couple spots. It's coming from the cost of housing, which can be brought down with lower rates. And it's been being increased from in, uh, insurance costs, which look like they're leveling off. And logically, they would level off. And Congress can put a lot of pressure on them by calling them to testify in Congress. about, hey, so why do you keep raising your insurance rates? So there really isn't a lot of pressure on inflation. Wage increases have dissipated. Lower costs of housing would lower inflation. Insurance, which was the surprise in the inflation number, flattening out. We already know producer prices have come way down and are flat. So all the people pounding the table about inflation are wrong. We've been full of shit for about 40 years. You know the old saying about it's the different this time being the most dangerous words in investing? Well, they are. I just saw somebody say it on Seeking Alpha. It's different this time. It's not. You have to really enjoy pounding your head into a brick wall to think that inflation is the boogeyman. We had a once in a hundred year pandemic that shut down the economy, destroyed supply chains temporarily. Screwed up employment, confused everybody, depressed everybody, got everybody angry at each other. And while everybody was here being political, OPEC cut oil supply. China did zero COVID policy, not because they care about anybody. They're the one that released COVID, whether it was on accident or on purpose, who knows. But they are the ones that screwed up the supply chains. They did it on purpose. Russia took part in the oil cuts and then invaded Ukraine. So you have Saudi Arabia, Russia, and China that tried to create enduring inflation and create a narrative so they can get somebody in office in the United States manipulating our inflation or manipulating our elections so they have somebody that they can take advantage of and get a better deal out of and enable them to do what they want. We'll see if that guy comes back. Anybody who votes for President Trump as a protest vote because you want to see the elites and everything else you know, under pressure, yeah, you need a different champion because he's the wrong one. A lot of the bad things that have happened in the last seven years were because Trump enabled nations that don't give a shit about the United States other than extracting our wealth to do what they wanted, which is raise the price of oil, take advantage of manufacturing subsidies to their corporations, which we're not allowed to do technically. We do it anyway, not as much as, say, China. And then Russia, you just have an asshole running that country. And eventually that'll change, but we'll see. I thought it would have happened last year, maybe this year. So with inflation looking like it's about to take another step down in the next couple of months, what can we take away from all of the inflation scares? Is that every time the market had a little dip, it was a good time to buy. So I think in the next month or so, whatever little dip we get, you really want to buy it. And that's been my message for a while now, for several months. Expect a second quarter dip and you should buy it. But what should you buy? Well, the returns on small caps versus large caps goes through cycles. And typically small caps will outperform large caps for about a decade after underperforming for a number of years. Over the very long term, small caps have outperformed large caps, mainly because small cap businesses have been the backbone of the economy since, since the country started. Right now we have the mega caps dominating and they have the most cash. So I wouldn't expect them to do horribly. But after those 20 or 30 largest companies in the U.S. markets, start picking them apart. And what you start to realize when you look at the rest of the S&P 500 is that between 100 and 200 companies are in big trouble because they have no growth, they still have debt, and they really are at the peak in all the valuation ranges. So whatever valuation measure you want to use, you have 100 to 200 companies on the S&P 500 that are at the extreme high end, really have nowhere to go but down, Given that their companies have no growth and still have debt to service, especially the dividend payers is going to be wreak havoc on, what are they going to do? Are they just going to just keep trying to stretch things out? Well, the answer is yes. 
how do investors feel about that? As baby boomers get older and die, as pensions start to pay out and have to reduce their portfolios, right? Pensions necessarily have to sell and they're mainly in large caps. I think you are about to see an outperformance period by small caps, especially with low interest rates coming that lasts a while. I said two or three years. Tom Lee is saying a better part of a decade. I don't know if that means that absolutely small caps will do great the whole decade, but I do think that they'll do better than large caps. All the history says so. The circumstances on inflation and interest rates say so. Now, what do we know about deflation? We know that deflation probably is going to be what we're talking about again sometime later this decade. And in deflationary periods, it's the little guys that do really well. They don't have the big company problems of not having growth. Small companies grow. Why? Because why else would you do it? Big companies run into periods where they have to downsize and right size. So you should expect a small cap outperformance period that lasts anywhere from two to three years to the better part of a decade. Somewhere in between, everything is bad. But ultimately, low interest rates are very good for small companies. And in an environment where there is disinflation and potentially deflation, small companies will do best. Large companies can drop 50, 60, 70, even 90%. We saw that twice in the last 25 years. So here is Bank of America telling everybody, hey, you really ought to be looking at small cap. So... I don't have a lot of great large cap picks. I just do the research. I let it take me where I want it to take me or where it wants to take me. And there's very few large caps that I'm super interested in. So in an environment where inflation has already come down a lot, the last couple things that are causing inflation to be sticky are mainly housing prices, home prices, rent, shelter prices, and insurance. Just takes a little bit of logic to say, well, what would bring the cost of housing down would be lower interest rates. And what will cause insurance rates to stop going up? It'll be Congress saying, hey, why are you doing that? It's already happened. They've already been asked to testify. And by the way, we have this big federal debt. It's costing us a trillion dollars every four to six months. How do we lower that? Well, the answer is lower interest rates. Then finance things out. When you do finally get a recession or a period where you have to lower interest rates to, say, 2%, you know, they're up a five and a half right now, then you stretch out the debt over a decade. Right now, most of the federal debt is financed on two years that are coming due. We do actually have more tenures out there than we normally do. That was something good that uh, Trump's Secretary of uh, Treasury did, the second one. Remember, Gary Cohen quit the Trump administration because he said that Trump policies would cause stagflation, something that I warned about twice in the last five years, back in 2018 and then again in 2021. And that was really party agnostic. If the Fed screws up, they can cause stagflation. I think they are fully aware of that. I've heard Austin Goolsbee and several other Fed presidents talk about it. So they are fully aware that they can't be too terribly aggressive. Powell has already said that we're at the peak of interest rates. There's some article on Seeking Alpha right now that says the Fed should raise again. Just, I don't even remember who wrote it, but it, it is so ass backwards. But I don't know what else it takes for me other than say inflation has been above 3% three years. Three, three years out of the last 40. Maybe this will be the fourth year, but it's going to be cutting it close. Inflation isn't the boogeyman, deflation is. And if we just rebuild the world to be more sustainable, We'll get two generations of growth. All the bills get paid off. Everybody lives better. Save the planet. And then we can focus on skipping around the galaxy. There's a very bright outlook out there. If we don't let cognitive dissonance and ideology, extremism on both sides, mess us up. So for me, I'll take the centrist that I can get. I'm slightly left of center centrist. But as you know, I work for McCain. He's a slightly right of center centrist. Doesn't matter to me. Let's just stay away from the extremists and the crooks. And then this will all play out. Interest rates will come down because we have to finance the baby boomers. See the federal budget flatten out at some point. Growth of over 3% pays for everything. And that's true. If we can keep GDP growth over 3% and get rid of the tax cuts for the top 1%, everything works out. That's just the math. Math is hard. Much harder to explain than they took our gerbs. I hate those people, right? Math is hard, but it pretty much explains all of this. So we can make our decisions how we make our decisions on the investment side, the political side, the social side, how we talk to people, how we behave on the internet. For me, I remain optimistic that things are going to work out and that women will save America and that small caps will start to outperform because of a number of factors. Interest rates coming down being the number one factor because inflation is not the boogeyman. And longer term, 
as boomers retire and we get deflationary pressure, small companies will do well. Entrepreneurs will do well. People who decide, you know, I was just working at XYZ big company and they got rid of me. I'm going to buy a property and put a little business in it. My son's looking to do that. My daughter already does it. I think a lot of millennials who have made money on the back of big companies and they've saved a little bit are suddenly going to become 50-year-old small business people. I think standard of living goes up with it. The Gen Zers are already moving that direction. So long as everybody stays above their level of cynicism and the way they behave, it all works out. So in the shorter term, this is a pretty clear indicator that your rotation in the small caps ought to be getting to the maximum point here imminently. The small, small caps are going to start to outperform. You've already shown a little bit of jitterbug strength in the last several months. And as soon as those interest rates come down, which I think is June, I mean, I, I think they should do it in May. Well, again, they're not going to listen to me. When they pull that half point off, holy cow, off to the races. And then eventually we hit the boomer retirement. All right, let me shut this down, get this edited, and let's bring on Shooter for Major Markets.